Hello, my name is Pastor Joel Silverman. Thank you for watching the Regeneration Church broadcast. It's my hope that through this message, you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of his word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. Um, God really speaks to us a lot in this book about even times of suffering, and change can bring suffering, amen? Suffering comes in a lot of different sizes and shapes, but change can be one of them. But as we go into this, I want to just uh, bring forth also a precious uh, just word over our own church. You know, we have just celebrated our seventh anniversary as Regeneration Church, amen? To the Lord be the glory. And uh, going into our eighth year, and eight means new beginnings, and uh, we know God has good things and wonderful things and new beginnings in store, obviously, for this young family that's leaving us, but also for this house as well. Amen? And so we're looking forward to that. So. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you. We're, we're so grateful to you, Lord God, that, Father, you remain the same. No matter what changes around us, you are the same today as you were yesterday, and you will be forever. And, Lord, we entrust ourselves into your wonderful, wonderful care in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, as we've been going through the book of 1 Peter, we've been discussing much on the fact being that it's about our character, it's about our conduct, it's about our lifestyle, it's not just the words that we say or words that we preach or teach or anything else, but it really is about who I am in the Lord. Who is that person, especially that person during the week when nobody else sees. I remember years back someone had written a book, what is it, The Man in the Mirror, Who You Are When Nobody's Looking, and uh, that could be true of all of us. Who am I really? And God wants us to be the real deal at all times. Amen? We're not perfect, but at least we ought to have an attitude of that in our heart for the Lord. So during this whole book, the Holy Spirit keeps reminding us, keep an eternal perspective. No matter what's happening in your life, keep an eternal perspective. And the Spirit himself will work in us to remind us of that, that God has has eternity in mind for all of us. We really are just passing through this life. Though we love it and we're blessed by it and God has given us many blessings in it, we're really just passing through this. And so we, he wants to remind us that in the midst of that passing through, there's going to come trials, there's going to come tribulations, there's going to come testings. Those things are not meant by God uh, to destroy us in any single way. They are really meant to test our faith, to make our faith stronger, make us stand strong in the, in the ways of the Lord. And so if you remember last week in chapter three, we really talked about the wife's role and the husband's role. And uh, we had brought up the fact that during this time in this culture that they lived in, it was unthinkable for a woman, a wife to take on or go into a new religion separate from her husband. This was just not something that was done in that day and age. Remember, but women had no rights then whatsoever. And so what Peter is telling them is you have to have the character of Christ. And the way that character comes forth in that wife's role is a character of submission. We're not talking about submitting to wrongdoing or any kind of abuse, but we're talking about a godly attitude within a woman's heart that can influence her husband in the hopes of him making that decision to come to the Lord. It's still his decision to make. Amen? And so God's word, that was a very, very um, different word in that time. It was really a very challenging word. And so the word also, Peter says in, in uh, the third chapter, that the role of the husband is really to honor and respect his wife as a fellow heir of grace so that his prayers would not be hindered. And we talked about at that time in Jewish tradition, and the church was all predominantly Jewish at this time, that for a man to hear that his prayers would be hindered was very challenging to that man. He would not want that to be. And so these instructions that the Spirit of the Lord is giving in the Word were shocking truths given to believing people 
at those truths between husband and wife, obviously for marriage, so that this, they would stand out in the society that they were living in. That their marriage would be different from every single marriage around them. That's exactly what God wants for us today. Exactly the same thing. Our marriages are not to look like the marriages of the world. They are to look different. They are to have an eternal perspective in them. And so as we allow God, whether we're male or we're female, to do in us what these words are sharing in chapter 3, as we allow God to do that, you're going to watch not only your own heart change, but your marriage will begin to be influenced by the word of God, which produces life. And so we need to understand that even this day, 2,000 years later, our marriages need to reflect the love of Christ. Now, how many of us would say in the day that we are in, that is a challenge? Same kind of a challenge as the day that these people lived in as well. So the Holy Spirit continues to stress that whether it's in our marriages, whether it's just in life, situations, problems, troubles, we are going to go through different times of suffering. And so we need to understand that there's a suffering that happens just because of life and the situations that are in life. And then there's a suffering that can also happen because of our faith. And the fact that in our faith, we're going to stand out, as the Bible tells us, as peculiar people. And so we are going to suffer because our Savior suffered. Now, when we're talking about suffering in context, biblical context, we're not talking about having a victim mentality. This is not a, oh, woe is me, you know, I'm going to slide myself along the floor, life is horrible. Not at all. What it's talking about, though, is suffering will come to all of us because the truth is sometimes as believers, when suffering comes to us, we get really shy shocked by it. And many times we say, what is, why is this? What is this? What's happening to me, Lord? What's going on here? And it shocks us. And God wants us to understand it's just part of life. We live in a fallen, sinful world. People separate from Christ are fallen and sinful. That is going to produce pain, not a whole lot of life. And so the word is warning us and challenging us and telling us when these things happen to you, don't let your faith be shaken. God is still the same. He is still in control. You're not a victim. You're not a martyr, but you are going to do go through stresses. And when those stresses happen, they're actually allowed by God to press us into the Lord deeper than we were before. How many of us would say that maybe I was just kind of floating through my walk with the Lord and then some trouble came into my life and wow, did that wake me up in the Lord. Lord, real quick. And I said, God, wait a minute, where are you? And we start to press into the Lord. That's why God even allows it in our life. So let's look at our first PowerPoint. We're going to go into chapter four, first Peter chapter four. And the verse says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. How many of us would say when you start to suffer, especially if you're suffering in the flesh, your thoughts of any kind of sinful desires or wrong desires go right out the window? Amen. Isn't that true? Because you're so consumed by what you're going through. And the scripture is addressing that. It's literally saying when you go through these things, even though we're still going to live in the flesh, we're alive yet and, and a human being, we are to be mindful that in the flesh I am to be living for Christ and the will of God. Let's look at our next one. Scripture continues, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. That really means sinful living. That's really what that's meaning. 
having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. How many of us could say, oh yeah, I relate to these things in my past. <laughs> in all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, which is just a reckless lifestyle, and they malign you. The, word, the world is going to malign you when you don't follow their ways. But they will give account to him, meaning the Lord, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So the word of God is clear. As believers in Christ, we will suffer in many ways just as Jesus suffered. But now as believers, we should not be suffering for wrongful choices any longer. Wrong decisions. How many of us would say I've suffered for wrong decisions in my life big time? Every one of us can raise our hands. Yet the Father, God the Father, did not even spare his own son Jesus from suffering. And so he will allow suffering into our life. It comes in many, many different forms and shapes, but suffering to that person, whatever that person is going through, is suffering to them. That's why you can never judge and look at someone else and say, oh, that's so ridiculous. They're making a big deal out of whatever. That's a suffering to that person. Mm -hmm. And God understands that and his heart is with them. It can be health issues. We have many in our own church we're praying for. Our fears for our children, financial worries, deaths, divorces, loss of jobs, broken relationships. We could go on and on and on. These things produce a suffering within the life of a person. So we could say, then, why is it so important to God that he actually sees suffering as necessary in a person's life. God sees that as a necessary ingredient in a person's life. And we're going to see the answer on the next PowerPoint. Hebrews 5, 8 says, even though Jesus was God's son, he learned what? Obedience from the things he suffered. Guess where you learn obedience? When you suffer. Because those are lessons that are driven home to every one of us. Look at the next. It's the same scripture, different translation. And though he was a son, through the pain which he underwent, the knowledge came to him of what it was to be under God's orders. Boy, I know when I read that, that drives a lot of memories home to me of things I suffered and learned in. I can remember saying to the Lord, I'll never do this again. I will never do this again. And by his grace, kind of sticking with it, at least for the most part. But you learn because you're in pain. It hurts. I don't want to be here. It's a suffering. And so we learn obedience if we let the lesson be taught to us. Now we can resist it. We can say, hey, going to do my own thing for a while yet. And God will say, okay, love you too much. I'll never take your will away from you, but you're going to, you're going to suffer, not punishment, consequences. God is not a punishing God. If God was a punishing God, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would all be doomed. But he allows us consequences because he's saying, stop going in this direction. This direction will destroy you. So we need to understand that. Next PowerPoint. There's something in suffering that causes us to be humbled and our pride broken. It causes us to cry out to the Lord with humility. We have hit a wall in life that is much bigger than we are. And without God's help, there's no way out. Amen. How many of us say, been there, been there, done that? And that's what suffering, God, that's why God allows suffering in our life. Now, while Jesus didn't need to suffer, we need that because of our sinful, rebellious lifestyle. Remember, our, na our nature in itself is rebellious. Tell somebody no and watch how well they do with it. You watch that rebellion just come right up comes right up inside each and every one of us. Yet Jesus was willing to endure everything you and I suffer on this earth. 
so he could know and identify every pain that we suffer. That's why no one will ever look into the face of Christ and say, you don't know what I went through. Everyone will know, and he knows what everyone goes through. So why did Jesus do it? Why did he suffer in his life? Well, he had a goal in mind. The goal was your salvation. Yes. The goal was my salvation. Jesus became submissive to the Father. Just as we talked about, when he's saying to a, a wife in a marriage, become submissive. When the word of God says in Ephesians 5, submit ye one to another. God looks for an attitude of submission because it's the attitude of Christ. Christ was not willful and rebellious as he walked on this planet. He lived in submission to the Father. And so he was submissive to him. And he obeyed the Lord, the Father, in spite of knowing what he would go through. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He knew what he was going to suffer, yet he was submissive. Remember last week we talked about submission and how submission is to work for the greater good. Remember we talked about that? When you submit in any situation, think of even in a working relationship, when you submit to your boss, you submit to the principles of that company, it works for the greater good of the whole unit. And so Jesus suffering during his life and also on that cross was for our greater good. It was for the good of the whole of humanity. The whole of humanity has been blessed because of the suffering of Jesus Christ. Whether they have received that or not received that, they are blessed because Jesus was submissive and Jesus suffered. He allowed his suffering to be used for good. Next PowerPoint, Colossians 1.13. Look what it says, for he, Jesus, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you, that is a scripture we should all just jump right through the roof about. That's why he suffered, because he knew his suffering would bring forth our redemption. He knew that without his his suffering, we could never be redeemed. If at any point in that garden of Gethsemane or at that point on that cross, he turned to the father and he said, I cannot do that. We were doomed. Amen. We were doomed. There was no other answer. And so by God's grace, he stayed in his commitment and in his submission to the Father. And out of that terrible suffering, we have reaped the blessing of redemption. Hallelujah. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Ransomed. There was a price over your head, a price over my head could not be paid. And Jesus said, I'm stepping in. I'm paying the price for that person. Get them out of that jail. They are set free by my blood blood. That alone, the suffering of Christ, what it has brought forth in our lives. Now, secondly, Peter says part of our suffering will come from rejecting the godless type of lifestyle we all used to live and society lives today. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. First Peter 4, 3. You've already... I love this. This is the message. You've already put in your time in that God-ignorant way of life. How many of us could say, amen? Partying night after night, all you partiers. Drunken, prolific at life, which means just reckless living. Now it's time to be done with good. I've told my own stories. I won't go into it now of swinging over a gate, but we won't go there. <laughs> of course, your old friends don't understand why you don't join in with the old gang anymore, but you don't have to give an account to them. Amen. They're the ones who will be called in the, on the carpet and before God himself. Our gate swinging days are over. Amen. We're moving forward in the Lord. Psalm 14 one says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's a fool. 
Listen, as believers, we can't be foolish either. Amen. Don't think you can do things. No, oh, God, no, oh, God doesn't see it. You know, God, God, sometimes people say, God, turn away. Turn away from what? <laughs> He's looking fully at us at all times, numbered the hairs on our very heads. And so next PowerPoint, Chuck Swindoll says, if we view life as a schoolroom and God is the instructor, it should come as no surprise when we encounter pop quizzes and periodic exams. Oh, how, how many of us, I hate tests. I hated tests in school, I still hate tests. Maturity in the Christian life is measured by our ability to withstand the tests that come our way without having them shake our foundation or throw us into an emotional tailspin. Bottom line. The Holy Spirit wants us to understand nothing moves us closer to Christ than trials and tribulations. When we go through the hard times, that's when we lean into the Lord a whole lot more than we have maybe just prior. It is meant to humble us. It's not meant to break us. It's meant to humble us. Remember your will and my will is strong. We are strong-willed people. We are not humble, broken, and contrite by our nature. Our fists are raised at God by our nature. It's the grace of God that starts lowering those fists in us and causing us to press into him. The Holy Spirit wants us to remember that at all times. It's for humility. It's for God to create a contrite heart. He's not against you when you go through trials. He's with you, but he wants you to press in and to come to know him as never before. So the word continues that if we do wrong, if and when we do wrong, we should expect to suffer for that. And he describes the categories, this is very interesting, of wrongdoers, murderers, thieves, and criminals. And we're going to look at this scripture next PowerPoint, and he speaks about meddlers. PowerPoint number eight. Make sure, Pastor Joel, that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or get this, a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he or she is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. So murderers, thieves, and criminals, obviously that's self-describing. By their own actions, they've done something wrong that has brought pain and heartache into their own life. But Peter adds the word meddler. Now listen to this. The word meddler means one who gets involved in the, in the affairs of others when they have no business being there. We would say today, a nosy body. How many of us would say, oh, I know a meddler? Hopefully you're not one. If the person who makes things, it, it is the person who makes things worse by what they say or do. You know when people just want to hear the news? You know, how are you doing? But they really just want to hear the news. And then they're going to tell you something. It's like the last thing you need to hear on the planet. <laughs> that is a meddler. Peter puts meddling or a meddler, get this, in the same class with murder. Remember, he said murder. He said thieves. He said criminal. So he puts it in the same class with murder because it is a form of character assassination. <laughs> When you meddle and you tear down somebody else and, oh, I'm just saying and, oh, I'm just praying, and you go against that person's reputation and you tear that person down, let me tell you, God does not take lightly to that. And I want to bring up today with social media, beware. Beware. Because it's frightening what can happen to people from social media. I had a family that I was working with. They literally felt that they had to pick up and leave the area, and they moved out of state because of things put on social media against one of their children. You're talking frightening stuff. That's powerful stuff. The media is powerful. If we're putting, and what we're putting on social media, you better make sure it, one, glorifies the Lord, and two, can be written on the New York Times tomorrow morning. And if it cannot be, do not put it on there. That is really the bottom line. Next PowerPoint. 
1 Peter 4.17 tells us this, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? I want to just say this, and we could really do a whole teaching on it, but for time's sake, everybody is not going to heaven. Painful truth. Everybody is not going to heaven. Now, I have never attended a wake in my life where anybody ever thought the person was anywhere else but in heaven. That's called deception. We are not to be deceived, church. Do you know what we need to be for people who don't know the Lord? On our knees. That's what we need to be. Everybody is not going to heaven. Scripture is clear. First, judgment begins with the house of God. That means you and I. That means there's no, there's no sloppy agape. There's no shady grace. There's no uh, looking the other way, God says, and don't worry about you. We are all responsible and accountable before the living God. And the word says in whom we have to deal with. There is a dealings with God. God is a holy God. He is an awesome God. You know, the angels and the saints that are living in heaven, they, they are be, beside themselves in adoration of who the Lord truly is. Hallelujah. We are not to take God so lightly and so glibly while he is love and he loves us and cares for us. He is God. He is the Lord. He is the almighty one. And our hearts need to have that reverence, Amen. that adoration for our God at all times. Never take Take the grace of God lightly. Don't ever assume you have tomorrow. I buried a brother at 36 years old. His tomorrows were over real quick. Went like that when he dropped dead from a heart attack. No one was expecting that. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. God says Count your days, number your days, meaning we are to have an awesome reverence for God and his mercy, his love and his care. But the bottom line is I better make sure I'm walking the straight and narrow so that I don't have to be concerned that, Lord, let me be right before you, clean hands and a pure heart. Don't play or trifle with the grace of God. So the word says that judgment is beginning at the house of God, and it begins with us first. And what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Well, it's called a place. It's called hell. And that is the sad truth. And people say, well, why would God send people to hell? Well, he doesn't. He's never sent one soul to hell, ever. People send themselves to hell. Amen. That is the sad but honest to God truth. Why do they send themselves to hell? Well, go past John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him has received eternal life. But down into 17 and 18, it says, but man chose darkness more than the light. We in our nature love darkness and sin and selfish living more than we do. We would never have chosen God, but that God went out after you and all reached into our life and said, come on and come on home. It is the mercies of God that have kept us and brought us into any salvation at all. But the world today, it hates Christ. The world hates the name of Christ. They do not want to hear it. God is okay, but you bring up the name Jesus and you see what reaction you get. They hate who he is, they hate what he says, and they hate what he did. If we would renounce him, the world would be very happy. They would leave us alone. The truth is they really don't hate us. They hate the Christ in us. And it is the Christ in you they're looking to persecute. When we see this persecution going on throughout the world in the day we live in, it is a voice that is trying to silence the voice of Christ. It is the spirit that has arisen against the truth of Jesus Christ and who he is and wants to shut that voice up. Now listen. 
That's why the world does not persecute a worldly Christian. Amen. I'm going to say it again. That's why the world does not persecute a worldly Christian. You're living in the world. You're just, you know, easy going along. Oh, everything's fine. I get along with everybody. I don't say anything to anybody. I don't rock the boat. You are living in compromise. And the world does not persecute a worldly Christian, only a godly one. Yes. True persecution is a sign you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. And the world is not happy. Stand up in your job and just start to take a minor stand for Christ and watch the reaction that you get. But when you suffer as a Christian, you share in the sufferings of Christ. It literally is a picking up the cross and walking through our life. We are not going to be popular in the world we live in. Amen. We're just not. We are a peculiar people. We are a people that should be standing out amongst those we live with. Not better than, but saved from. And that's, we need to be walking in the truth of that word. I am redeemed. I am rescued. I'm not better than other people. But out of the redemption that I have received and the mercy of God that I have come to know, I need to be able to go to that other person and say, this is what Christ has done in me. He will do the same in you. No one is without hope who is in Christ. But the word says, when we live in the world without Christ, we live as those who have no hope. There is no hope in the world itself today. What government is saving you from your suffering? <laughs> Nothing. What's going to make you feel better in the world? Nothing. Our answers are in Christ. And that's why we need to be devoted and wholly sold out to Christ. Amen. Devoted with a single eye, consecrated daily to the Lord. It's a battle to be a Christian in today's world. It is not easy. You are flying in the face of society. You are saying there is something else that the world doesn't offer me. The world doesn't like that kind of statement. Right. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. So 1 Peter 4.19 says, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. The word commit here, Roland's going to love this, is a banking term that means deposit. Wow. Think about that. The scripture says, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator, obviously the Lord, and continue to do good. And the word commit in that scripture is literally a banking term like you would deposit money in a bank. That's what you do when you commit your life to the Lord. There is an eternal bank account in heaven. There are books in heaven that are to have our names written in them. And we need to understand God takes these things very seriously. So there are going to be many, many times in our lives when problems come, trials come, tribulations, that we need to commit or deposit all of our life again into the hands of the one who created us. You know, we pray first for salvation, yes, but there has to be times of recommitment to the Lord over and over in our life. I know in every trial that I have ever walked through, at some point in that trial, I will get on my knees and say, Lord, I am committing myself to you anew and afresh. I'm asking you not only to get me through this, but to do in me what needs to be done in me. That's what this scripture is saying. Make a deposit in your heavenly bank account of commitment to the Lord that no matter what's gone on in your life, no matter what your hopes have been disappointed, no matter what heartache has come in, no matter what prayer is not answered yet, commit yourself unto your creator. He created you. He made you. He formed you. He knows what you need. He's with you. He'll carry you through. Don't take yourself back and pull away from the very source of your help. When the world 
raises their fist against God, they don't even realize they have cut themselves off from the source of their help and their redemption. We are not to do the same, beloved. So we need to know that many times in our life, we will commit ourselves anew and afresh to the living God. When trouble comes and your life begins to crumble around you, when your hopes and dreams are crushed, nothing is more important than to take that time and commit your life anew and afresh before the Lord. He alone is the one who is sovereign over every detail of your life. Number the hairs on your head. You think he doesn't know what you're going through? Of course he does. So Peter is telling us over and over, trust in the Lord. He is in control. Nothing comes into your life that is not father filtered. Means God has seen it and he has eternal purpose in it. He has something he wants us to learn in the season of our suffering. Your suffering will never be wasted. When we get to heaven and God shows us the times we have suffered and what he did in us at that time, we are going to be astounded and we're going to be amazed. Let's look at our last PowerPoint because God has eternal purpose in this. Look at this an acronym, GRACE. God's riches at Christ's expense. Let's stand to our feet. God's riches at Christ's expense. There is no cheap grace. A great price was paid for us to walk in grace. A great price. The price of Christ himself. God's riches come at the expense of Jesus Christ. So Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you for your word that is truth. We thank you for your word that challenges each and every one of us, Lord, because we need to be challenged. And we thank you, God, that your word gives us instruction, correction, direction. It gives us hope, Lord. It makes semblance out of the things that we go through, the things that we suffer, even our trials, Lord. And Father, we thank you that we can entrust ourselves into your loving care, no matter what is going on in our life, and know that you will bring us into the next season, which will have the hope of Christ in it. So Lord, just put your hand on your own heart between you and the Lord. Just commit yourself just anew and afresh of who you are and where you're at just today. That God, I want to make a new and a fresh commitment to you. I'm entrusting myself into your loving care. And I'm saying, Lord, you bring me through this season that I may glorify you and I may be a voice to those around me that there is a God who will never forsake me and never leave me. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you would like to hear more, we encourage you to visit our website at regenerationchurchny.com. So if you're ever in the area, please stop by. We'd love to have you at our Regeneration Church Sunday service or our tender-hearted message on Monday night. Again, we thank you for watching, and may God richly bless you.